Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, seriously. It's uh, it's vexing. You know, you can only take so much of it. I like to be informed. I like to know what's going on. But at some point, it's the same thing every day, you know. And so, yeah, I've been watching less of it myself. Um, come, I've uh, been getting some interesting things from the scriptures. I don't personally. I mean, I think the Lord's been showing me some. And uh, I'll, I think I might either preach on it or teach on it next week or the following week. But uh uh, pertaining to the nation and uh, maybe what the Lord has in store. And I came across something the other day, some verse doesn't make sense to me, I asked the Lord, what in the world is this talking about? One thing led to another, led to another, and I found something kind of interesting. So I'll be trying to bring that here in a couple weeks. Um, give me the thumbs up, Mark, if uh, we're good to go. Good to go? All right, good. All right, but uh, let's go ahead and turn to Mark 20, Matthew 22. This is something that I believe the Lord showed me in my Bible reading not too long ago. And um, I think, I hope it'll be a help to you. Hopefully I'll be able to get this across in such a way that'll make sense. But uh, I think it's interesting and I think it's worth definitely considering. So uh, before we get started, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning and I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, God, once again, for giving us this place to meet, Lord. I reckon that uh, there's a number of churches that are pretty big and because of their size, they can't meet together. And we have the advantage of being able to meet together. So thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you'd uh, speak through me this morning. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit and I pray you speak to the hearts of your people and give them understanding and help me to be clear and, uh, and get this point across today. And I trust you for that in Jesus name. Amen. All right, so Matthew 22, verse 15. Let's go ahead and start there. Matthew 22, 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Now, at this point in Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees are getting pretty upset with Jesus. This is getting pretty close to chapter 27 uh, with the crucifixion and the events of all that. This is toward the end of Jesus' ministry. And uh, they're getting pretty upset with Jesus. And through parables, Jesus is starting to give some not so subtle hints that the Pharisees are wicked men who are going to be destroyed when Jesus comes to power. Look at Matthew 22, verse 42. Because bear in mind, when Jesus came preaching, or Matthew 21, when Jesus came preaching, he came preaching the kingdom of heaven as a hand. The kingdom of heaven is Israel being restored to its, uh, basically its rule, its dictatorship over the world with Jesus Christ as the king. And he said, this time is at hand. And if the people had the faith to receive it, they could have gone that, they could have overthrown Rome, and history would be very different than it is today. But it didn't go that way, as you know. But in Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of thereof. All right. Now that's, he said kingdom of God there. He didn't say kingdom of heaven because that uh, gospel is going to go to the Gentiles and the Gentiles don't have a earthly, physical, visible kingdom that's offered to them. It's a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is a spiritual thing. So, but he said that thing is going to be shifted over to the Gentiles and they're going to receive the gospel, so on and so forth. Anyway, that's not the point. Verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The stone that Jesus is referring to is himself. Okay, The Pharisees are likened to builders who want to build a great edifice, but uh, refuse to have Jesus Christ as their chief cornerstone. The cornerstone sets the direction for the rest of the entire building. And I know that sometimes the cornerstone is presented as the capstone of a pyramid. I've heard that preached and taught for years, and that's an interesting theory. Me personally, the cornerstone is the foundation stone of a building, the very first corner that's going to form the square of the rest of the building. And it's on the ground, and that's why he said people would stumble at that stumbling stone. It's the cornerstone. You get a big rock, and it's the foundation of the building. It's the first one you set. You get it lined up exactly where you want, and then you build off the rest from there. All right, so Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and it's your foundation. And when we think of a uh, foundation these days, you know, if you get the first foundation wrong, if you get the first stone wrong, the whole rest of the building is going to be wrong. And in reality, the Pharisees aren't the only ones who reject Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Uh, people do it all the time. 
They refuse to build their life on Jesus Christ and instead choose the cornerstone of, let's say, religion or the cornerstone of education. They build their life around that cornerstone. All right. Uh, They build their life around the cornerstone of self or they choose sin for their cornerstone and they build their life all based on that singular stone. And whatever your cornerstone is, that is your foundation. And today when we think of a foundation, we generally think of, you know, a smooth concrete slab, if you've ever done construction, or maybe some footers, some concrete footers that go around the perimeter of a building. But like I said, in ancient times, that cornerstone, that singular stone at the start was the foundation of a building. Oftentimes they'd find a really big stone for that cornerstone. And in Isaiah 28, 16, the Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So the point is the the foundation is the cornerstone. And Jesus Christ should be the foundation, the cornerstone of your life. Every other aspect of your building, your life, should be positioned according to that stone, according to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is to be the foundation and the cornerstone of the kingdom of Israel. But the Pharisees rejected him and they killed him. They fell upon that stone, as in they killed him. You know, like in the Bible, the term falling upon often has to do with somebody murdering someone. Like Doeg Doeg the Edomite, when he uh, sold out David and the the priests of Nob and Saul had Doeg go and kill all those 85 priests of Nob. It says he fell upon them. It didn't mean that he like tripped and stumbled and landed on somebody. It mean he had a knife in his hand, a sword, and he was falling upon them and killing every one of them. And he said, and Jesus is saying, you guys are going to fall upon uh, upon uh, this cornerstone. The Pharisees were going to fall upon him, kill him. But then he said, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Meaning Jesus is going to come back and kill them. (laughs) Essentially, Jesus is basically saying, if you kill me, you're going to be broken. You fall upon that stone, you'll be broken. But uh, uh, and then he says, and later on, I'm going to fall upon you and grind you to powder. So rejecting Jesus is a lose-lose situation. <laughs> you fall on him and you're broken. He falls on you, you're ground to powder. So don't do either. Verse 45, it says, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So Jesus, Jesus is starting to turn up the heat on these Pharisees. And he gives another parable about them in chapter 22. We won't read through the whole thing. But the Pharisees end up coming up with a plan. And in Matthew 22, verse 15, it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they end up trying everything. They throw the whole kitchen sink at Jesus Christ. They got the Herodians coming at him with a legal question in verse 16. They got the Sadducees coming at him with a theological question in verse 23. And then the Pharisees come at him with a moral question in verse 35. And like some kind of uh, kung fu master, you know, he blocks and he dips and dodges and jukes and bobs and weaves through their questions. And then he counters with his own question that puts them back on their heels. Verse 41 through 46, he says, whose son is David and all this stuff. And it puts them on their heels. And then he comes at them full force in chapter 23. And that's where we're at right here in chapter 23, verse 1. This is the chapter where Jesus blows the Pharisees out of the water. And in chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Oh, that's interesting. That's weird. That's a strange thing to say. But then he says, But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. Hmm. Interesting. There's a lot to unpack here in this verse when you actually take it slow and start looking through and thinking about what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And that's to say that the scribes and Pharisees sit in, are in Moses' position of authority or in Moses' office. Uh, Moses was not the king of the Jews, nor were the Pharisees, but Moses did judge between disputes, and he was an intermediator, intermediator of sorts between God and men. And bear in mind that back in the Old Testament, the prophets and the priests served as mediators between God. That is, to get to God, you had to come to a priest or you had to go to a prophet. Right? You couldn't just go directly to God yourself back in the Old Testament times. Thankfully, that's not the way it is today. 
The Bible says there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we can go straight to God, fortunately. And you can go straight to God without consulting any man first. You've got the Word of God. You've got the Holy Spirit, and you are fully capable of thinking for yourself. Now, it's good to seek counsel, and it's good to ask others who have experience, but God has more experience and better counsel than anybody you could ever meet, right? <laughs> and He's recorded that counsel in this book, so never put any man above the book. And that's what these people were doing. The Pharisees were above the book is what we're going to see is the problem here. And uh, let me just point out also that there's no hierarchy in Christianity. I like to point this out because this is easy to forget in multiple, obviously, cults. It's like that. But even in Christian churches, there can be this misunderstanding that there's a hierarchy, a spiritual hierarchy. Well, you got the congregation and then the pastor and then God. It's not like that. Look at verse eight. He says, but be not called rabbi. That's teacher. For one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are what? Brethren. Not captains, not lieutenants, <laughs> just <laughs> brethren. <laughs> we are equals in the Lord. I'm not above you, you're not above me. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to put ourselves below each other and serve one another. But we're equals in the Lord. And pastors have, a res take, have to take responsibility you know, for the direction of a church, but they're not to take responsibility for the direction and decisions that you make in your home or in your life, you see. Um, that's your responsibility. Pastors are not to be masters. The Bible says, for one is your master, even Christ. Now, back in the Old Testament, the priests and the prophets, they were the caretakers and the repositories, basically, of the Scriptures. The average citizen did not have a Bible, and they, diff and they didn't have the Holy Spirit either, back in the Old Testament. Therefore, Moses and the men who assumed Moses' position had a great responsibility. Because they had the Word of God, and their job was to give it to the people. They had a great responsibility, and they had to be righteous men. And they had to judge justly. Because nobody could really check them to see if they were telling the truth or not. They didn't have the Scriptures. They didn't go to the uh, synagogue schools and learn the Word of God. It was a great responsibility on those people that were in Moses' seat. But the problem is they abused that position and that authority. And the Pharisees, the scribes, and the lawyers, not like uh, lawyers like we have today, but lawyers as in uh, experts on Old Testament law and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, like that was their job, they knew the law. These lawyers, they were the ones who communicated the Word of God to the people. They were like a bridge of sorts that people could get to know God. You'd have to learn from these people. You want to learn about God? You go to the synagogue because they're the ones that have the words of God. They're supposed to teach you. But because those men were corrupt, the people's knowledge of God and the people's knowledge of God's laws ended up getting messed up. And because they were the custodians of the scriptures, turn to Luke, Luke chapter 11, hold your finger there in Matthew 23. Because these men, the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, they were the custodians of the scriptures back in those days, because obviously they didn't have a printing press or a Bible app on their phone. You know, they didn't have that kind of access. They were the custodians of Scriptures, and they had what Jesus called the key of knowledge. Look at 11, Luke 11, 52. Woe unto you lawyers, you're the guys that hold the Bible, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered, in, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in Ye hindered. You see, the, the lawyers, they had the Bible, the scribes, the Pharisees. They had the words of God. They possessed it. They, and they had the information. They controlled the religious information that the people received. So, the information that you get affects your thinking, right? And your thinking affects your actions. And if you're given wrong information... You know, uh, or or have right information withheld from you, that is going to affect your thinking naturally. Uh, you know, just as a side note, that's why it's so dangerous to have uh, one side of information withheld from the people. Uh, they want to silence and suppress conservative information, right? And just have 
a certain kind of information come out, the liberal information, they should be able to have both. I'm not for silencing liberal information and just having conservative. You have to be able to have both, allow people to be able to choose for themselves. But as soon as you remove one and only have liberal information, we would say, well, we don't believe the liberal news media. But, there's, but what if there's no conservative information to be garnered or to be learned? Essentially, what you'd have to do is say, well, I don't believe this, but I don't have any alternative information. I don't know what's going on, but I know that can't be right. And, people, and eventually, people say, well, you're just a fool. You're rejecting information. You don't have any answers, but you reject this. How can you do that? You see? That's what ends up happening. You have to have both information. But these Pharisees, they didn't give the people the truth. And because of that, it affected the thinking of the people. And the Pharisees were the ones that were responsible for Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 23, verse 13. That's why Jesus is so hard on these Pharisees, because they were the ones responsible for whether or not the kingdom of heaven ended up coming in or not. And it's because they had the scriptures and they could have taught the people right They were the leaders. Verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. The Pharisees. It wasn't the people that Jesus railed on. It was the Pharisees. He says, For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are entering in to go in. A lot of the people wanted Jesus. They said, This is the king of the Jews, Hosanna. The people wanted it. But it was the Pharisees that said, these guys are going in and you're holding them back. You're messing them up. You're preventing this thing from coming through. You're the ones at fault. Jesus placed the blame for the kingdom of heaven's postponement squarely on the shoulders of the Pharisees. Was it not the Pharisees when the Israel stood before Pilate and uh, he said, what shall I do with this man? You know, and, the, and the Pharisees were the ones crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And they got the whole crowd to start shouting that. It was the Pharisees that did that. When it comes to the teaching of the Word of God, there's a huge responsibility to teach it right. And the Word of God is to be the authority, not the teacher. And you say, I've heard this before. I know you've heard it before, but you need to hear it again. (laughs) And a lot of the people that are listening uh, through online or YouTube or Facebook or Final Fight, maybe they haven't heard this before because maybe they don't get this at their church. Because there's a lot of churches where that's not spoken. It's not the Word of God that's the authority. They might say that, but in reality, it's the man teaching the Word of God that's the authority, and that's a problem. The, the problem here was the Pharisees. They sat in Moses' seat, but acted as though they were in God's seat. And look at what Jesus says next in verse 3 of chapter 23. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after the wor- their works, for they say and do not. I'm going to slow down and just dissect this verse this morning. Because depending on the way you read this and the way you interpret it, you you could end up coming out with something very wrong. And so I think this is an interesting verse that I just want to park on this morning. Jesus said, Whatsoever they, they, the Pharisees, bid you observe, that observe and do. Now what did Jesus mean by this? I mean, here he's going to blast them for the next... 30 verses, and he's telling them, whatever they say to do, that do it. Hmm. That's weird. Is Jesus saying that the people are to observe all the traditions that the Pharisees were teaching? They had all kinds of traditions. Is he saying, do the traditions? Is he saying, regardless of whether uh, what they are saying is right or or wrong, uh, you know, you're supposed to obey anyway? Is that what he's saying? It's an interesting thing to think about. Now, like I said, you need to make sure that you answer that correctly because this is where a lot of Christians become spiritual hamburger and get ground up in an abusive church. This area right here, that concept. The Pharisees were in a position of spiritual authority. So the question is, are people to do everything, were the people to do everything they say so as to respect the office? Is that what Jesus is saying here? Maybe the people didn't like the Pharisees. Maybe they're unpopular and people said, I don't like those people, but hey, you know, they're the shepherds, so we have to go along with it. Is that what Jesus was saying? Is that what Jesus is encouraging? And I ask that because that is literally what is encouraged in many churches. It doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree, whether it's right or wrong, you're supposed to just go along with it. Why? Because it's the pastor. 
He said so. Uh, the pastor is regarded as the authority, and you know whether you agree or disagree, like it or don't like it, if it's right or if it's wrong, your responsibility is to fall in line and go along with it. That's the, that's the attitude, the prevailing mentality in a lot of churches. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I, I realize that as a group... We need to be able to work together, okay? <laughs> and everyone has their own opinions about this decision and that decision. We're not all going to agree on everything. I get that. Um, and you can't always have it your way. And I can't always have it my way. That's just part of being a group. You have to be able to work together. That's part of being married. <laughs> you can't always have it your way. You know, sometimes you got to yield to one another and all these different things. That's all part of a group and working together. I'm not talking about the various superficial administrative decisions that, they, that take place in a church. I'm not talking about that this morning. What I'm focusing on this morning is abuses. The Pharisees were spiritually abusive people, and a spiritually abusive person's motto is, Whatsoever I bid you observe, that observe and do. Is Jesus seconding that? Is Jesus saying, yeah, whatsoever he bid you observe, that observe and do. Does Jesus approve of that? If that's what Jesus is saying, then okay, you know, whatever. But if that's what he's saying, then that's what he's saying. But admittedly, that would be leaving the door wide open for an abusive narcissist to step right in and have his way with the people. And he could say, well, hey, you have to listen to me because Jesus said, whatever I bid you observe, that you have to observe and do. Is that what he's saying? I really need people to understand this because this idea of, well, he's the leader, so we have to go along with it because Jesus said so is the bludgeon that's used to beat people either into submission or into expulsion. Do what I say, submit or get out. It goes on a lot. This is one of the Ten Commandments of a cult. Thou shalt do whatsoever the leader says. <laughs> uh, and people think if they don't do it, they're therefore in disobedience to God and therefore are sinning against God because Jesus said... Right? So it's interesting. You see how that works? The man is in Moses' seat. The scriptures are supposed to go forth from Moses' seat, right? But the man exchanges God's words for man's words. The man exchanges scripture with tradition. And because it's coming from Moses' seat, the people perceive the man's words as God's words. In other words... So when Jesus said, all therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, what's the context? The context is Moses' seat. All right. So now I'm going to start trying to show you what I believe Jesus is saying here. He's saying it within the context of Moses' seat where the scriptures were. In other words, I believe what Jesus is saying here is, all things that they bid you observe from the scriptures, from Moses' seat... The things that are uh, uh, congruent with what Moses said, the word of God, that observe and do. In other words, even if the person who is teaching or preaching the Bible is a scoundrel, if what he is saying is scriptural, you need to do it regardless of the man. No Christian can ever use the excuse, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but the person who said it is a jerk, I don't like that pastor, so therefore I can excuse myself from doing what the Bible says. You see, that's not going to work. There are a lot of Christians, for example, who don't like Dr. Ruckman. You know, they say, oh, well, he was crude, he was obnoxious, he was vulgar, he was this, he was that. They can think whatever they want. But what usually follows is, therefore, because I don't like Dr. Ruckman, uh, he can't be right about the King James Bible. Or I don't have to agree with any of the doctrines that he taught. Well, hold on. Not liking a man's personality is no excuse for rejecting truth. Okay? You have to be able to set the person aside and examine what is the man saying. If what he's saying is biblical, then you need to accept it. And if he's saying something that's unbiblical, you don't need to accept it. But determining, the determining factor is never how you feel about a person. You see? If it's coming from the Word of God, it doesn't matter whether you like me or don't like me or think I'm nice or a jerk or whatever. If it's Scripture, you have to be able to say, well, that's what the Bible says. 
even though I don't like that guy, he is right about that Bible verse right there. <laughs> and that's what Jesus is saying. All what they bid you observe, what? From Moses' seat, when they give you the Scriptures, observe it. Even though they are hypocrites, if it's Scripture, you need to do it. I believe that's what Jesus is saying here. I don't believe that Jesus is saying that you have to do everything the Pharisees say simply because, well, they're a Pharisee. They're one of the rulers. Nor do you have to do everything a pastor says simply because he's the pastor. These kinds of requirements form a cult mentality. Okay? Besides, Jesus himself, think about this, Jesus himself didn't even do everything the Pharisees told him to do, right? So is Jesus going to tell you to do something that he himself isn't even doing? I mean, one time he and Jesus and the disciples were out picking corn on the Sabbath day, you know, and when the Pharisees came along and they said, hey, you can't do that. You know, Jesus didn't say, well, you know, guys, there's really nothing wrong with it. But, you know, since you guys are the Pharisees, I'll go ahead and just submit and I'll yield. OK, we'll stop picking corn on the Sabbath days. All right, I get it. Is that, that's not what it did. How about this? One time Jesus was healing a guy's arm on the Sabbath day. And when the Pharisees got all mad and said, hey, you can't do that. He didn't say, oh, man, I, I don't guys, I don't really see what's wrong with it. I'm not. I mean, you guys would get your ox out of a pit on the Sabbath day. I mean, what's the problem? I mean, I, they, no, you can't do that. It's like, oh, man, well, you got, you know, you guys are the spiritual authorities and I need to submit myself. So. Buddy, come here. Sorry, man. I got to wither your hand back up. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll heal you tomorrow or something. <laughs> no, that's not what he did. That is not what he did. Right? The proper teaching here is if a Pharisee told someone to do something that was in accordance with the Word of God, with what's in accordance with Moses' seat, they need to do it. Not because the Pharisee said to do it, but because the Scripture says to do it. And if the Pharisee was just demanding that the people obey his tradition, they are not required to do it. That is something that's important. God's Word is the authority, not the Pharisee, not the pastor, not you, not me. God's Word is the authority. My job is simply to teach you what the Bible says and show you what God's requirements for your life are. Not what my requirements, or my denomination's requirements, or my church's requirements for your life are. So this interpretation, I believe, is perfectly consistent with the Bible, and the other interpretation is just uh, fodder and fuel for a cult. Uh, the interpretation, I believe, is fairly, further supported by the rest of the verse. Look at what he says. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not, do not ye after their works... For they say and do not. Now this is getting interesting. All therefore what they bid you observe, i.e. from the scriptures, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works. What are their works? Traditions. For they say and do not. The works of the Pharisees were their traditions specifically. And their traditions were causing people to disobey God's commandments. He said in Mark 7, 9, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Matthew 15, 3, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You see, there was a big problem in Israel with the traditions. That was a huge stumbling block for the Pharisees. They were clinging to their traditions at the expense of the commandments of God, remember? That was the big problem. Now here's what I want to highlight. Jesus says... For they say and do not. Now, this is obviously the definition of a hypocrite. You know, someone who tells you to do something that they don't even do. Uh, for example, doctors say your kids have to be vaccinated, but then they generally don't vaccinate their own kids. <laughs> Hypocrites. Uh, here's another example. Democratic state governors say that you have to wear a mask and social distance, but then they promote BLM protests, marches, and riots. Hypocrites. <laughs> or how about this? The news media accuses the president of a quid pro quo deal with Ukraine, which turned out to be false, but then ignores Joe Biden on camera, stating in front of a massive audience that he told Ukrainian officials that they wouldn't get any money from the U.S. government unless they fired the lawyer who is prosecuting his son, who is working with a Ukrainian energy company called Burisma. Hypocrites. <laughs> a hypocrite is someone who tells you to do something, but then doesn't do it themselves. But if that's the case, 
Let me ask you this, and this is where this whole lesson kind of started stemming from in my mind. If that's the case, a hypocrite is someone who tells you to do something they don't do themselves. How were the Pharisees hypocrites? How were the Pharisees hypocrites? I mean, did the Pharisees tell the people to keep the traditions? Yes, they did. Did the Pharisees keep them, the traditions themselves? Yes, they did. Hmm. So you have to stop and think. How are the Pharisees hypocrites? Jesus said that they say and do not. But based on what we know of the Pharisees, they did what they said. They did lots of things. They were OCD when it came to keeping the traditions. They were meticulous about their traditions. So then what is it that they're saying but not doing? Hmm. Now we know that their works are traditions. And we know what they were doing, right? So we know they were doing their traditions. But what were they saying that was opposite to what they were doing? Maybe the answer is very basic. And maybe we should say, well, you know, maybe they were saying, thou shalt not steal, and the Pharisees were stealing. Yeah, that might be. Maybe the Pharisees, you know, they'd get up and they'd preach, thou shalt not commit adultery, and they themselves were committing adultery. You know, there's some facts to back that up. And so maybe Jesus is saying, you know, do what they say. You know, they say, thou shalt not commit adultery, but do not after their works, their works of committing adultery. Maybe that's what he's saying. Maybe that's what he's saying, and that interpretation would be fine. I, I could live with that, no problem. But I kind of think there's something a little bit more to it than that. Because think about this. Some of the Pharisees were very immoral. That's true. But not all of them. Not all of the Pharisees were extremely immoral. Nicodemus was a good Pharisee who tried to keep God's moral commandments. Uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he was a good Pharisee who tried to keep God's moral commandments. He said that he admitted later that he blew it when it came to thou shalt not covet. But he got all the other ones. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, he killed Christians, but he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was obeying the Scriptures. The Scriptures say to stone blasphemers. So he thought he was ser serving the Lord. Okay? He said he did it in ignorance. All right? So it's not like every Pharisee was a saint by day and a sinner by night. <laughs> you know, they were, they were, some were total religious fakers, but not all of them. Much like, hey, I'll, I'll just say this, much like Catholic priests. Hey, look, think about this. Many Catholic priests are total religious fakers who use the position to take advantage of other people, and they're as wicked as hell. But it would be probably dishonest to say that they're all that way, okay, realistically. There are undoubtedly some men who became Catholic priests because they sincerely wanted to please God. And they wanted to go to heaven. And their mentality is, I want to please God. I want to go to heaven. I want to work my way to heaven. And so they get into the Catholic priesthood. They go through the whatever they do as children. And then they, uh, they become Catholic priests. And they try to do their best and serve their fellow man. And uh, teach Catholic doctrine and hope they go to heaven when they die. And they're maybe troubled by the immorality of a lot of the other priests and nuns around them. I, I have to believe that there's got to be some Catholic priests out there that are probably somewhat morally upright people. Just like the Pharisees. Now, I'm not giving a pass to Catholic priests, okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to candy coat any of that. I'm not trying to diminish the wickedness of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm just saying, I mean, even Brother Donovan said that he wanted to get into the Catholic priesthood, you know, initially when he was going to go through, the, what is that called, this, the, when you're a child and you go through the catechism. catechism. Yeah, he got involved in the catechism. Is that what it was, catechism? Yes. Yeah, he got involved in that because he wanted to please God. He really wanted to do the right thing. He thought that was right. Okay, so there's people like that. So since uh, some Pharisees were good, should Jesus have clarified his statement? He said, do not after there the Pharisees works, for they say they're Pharisees and do not. Do you think maybe he should have clarified his statement? I mean, could he tell the people to go ahead and do after a good Pharisee's works? You know, because they would say thou shalt not commit adultery and they wouldn't commit adultery. Maybe he should have clarified it a little bit. You know, do not go. Maybe could he tell people to go ahead and do after a good Pharisee's works, for they say and try their best to do. Is it okay to follow those Pharisees, just not the bad ones? Are the good Pharisees not hypocrites, just the bad ones? It's interesting to think about. I believe the answer is no, I don't think that's what he was saying. That's why I said initially, I think it's a little deeper than just the typical definition of hypocrisy. You see, all 
of the Pharisees were hypocrites, including Nicodemus, including the good ones who were trying their best. I believe they were all hypocrites in one way or another. Some were probably more so than others. But whether they were good or bad, whether they were sincere or insincere, Jesus didn't want the people to do after their works. What are their works? I believe their works are connected with the traditions. He was saying, watch out for that. You see, the hypocrisy here has to do with Scripture versus tradition. What God says versus what man says. Let me just write that down here. I'm going to say, well, no, never mind. I'm not going to write that down because I will confuse that picture here in a second. Here's what I think Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you know, these guys go around saying, God says not to pick corn on the Sabbath. And then they follow through, and they don't pick corn on the Sabbath. Wicked, right? And you're thinking, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You say, what's wrong with that? That actually sounds pretty consistent to me. <laughs> it sounds consistent, but it's actually inconsistent to the extreme. It is inconsistent for the Pharisees to go around saying, God says not to pick corn on the Sabbath, and then we're not going to pick corn on the Sabbath. That is an extremely inconsistent thing to say, because God did not say that. They are saying, God said, when really, they said it. They are saying, God says, and then doing what in reality, man says. Saying God said and then doing what man said is hypocrisy. Saying the scripture says and then doing what is in reality just tradition is hypocrisy. In plainer words, teaching man's traditions as God's commandments is hypocrisy. Because they say they are doing the will of God, when in reality they're doing just the opposite. They're doing the will of man. If I stop a Catholic on the way to Mass, and I ask him why he's going to Mass, and he says, well, I'm going to Mass because God says I have to. That man is a hypocrite. It doesn't matter how sincere he is. It doesn't matter how deceived he is. It doesn't matter how morally upright a person he might be. He is a hypocrite because he says he is doing God's commandments, but in reality is doing man's commandments. It's the exact opposite. What he is saying is the opposite of what he is doing. That is essentially the definition of hypocrisy. Saying one thing and doing the opposite. That is how they're hypocrites. They might not even realize it. Every single Pharisee in Israel taught the traditions of the fathers and all thought that by keeping the traditions, they were being obedient to God. And in that way, they were all hypocrites. Every single one of them, including Nicodemus. They were all saying something that was of God, but then doing what was of man. They were all saying that they were keeping God's commandments, but in reality, they were doing the exact opposite and were keeping man's traditions. So anyone who teaches a tradition as a commandment of God is, by definition, a hypocrite. A hypocrite. Because they're saying, because they are saying that God said something he didn't say, and they are doing something that man told them to do, but going around saying that God told them to do it. Their words are the opposite of their actions. Now, this isn't Jesus. This is a Pharisee. Okay. I should probably clarify. <laughs> All right, Pharisee. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know. How can I make this look like a... Oh, oh I know. I know. A phylactery. Exactly. <laughs> now we got a Pharisee. All right. So we got a Pharisee and a preacher. He's holding up the scriptures. He's holding up the scriptures, all right, and they're saying something, but what are they speaking? Tradition, while holding up a Bible, and holding up the, the word of the Old Testament, but what are they speaking? Tradition, and what does that make them? 
hypocrites do not after their works for they say one thing and then they do another they say thus saith the Lord and then they do thus saith man now can you see the hypocrisy element there okay now it's pharisaical hypocrisy is not necessarily the typical kind of hypocrisy that you think of you know you typically think of you know saying you should do something and then they're you know, they're saying you should be righteous, but then I'm wicked and I'm doing all these things on purpose and I'm, an, I'm a devil. You know, that's typical hypocrisy. Pharisaical hypocrisy is actually very, very subtle hypocrisy. It's very subtle hypocrisy that over, over time becomes a very diabolical hypocrisy. And it starts out not seeming hypocritical at all. You say, oh, well, I'm not a hypocrite. I preach that God says you must wash your hands before you eat anything. And I always do that myself. How am I a hypocrite? You're not a hypocrite in the typical sense of the word, okay? But you are a hypocrite in the subtle sense of the word. That's the title of my sermon this morning, by the way. Uh, the most subtle hypocrisy. The most subtle hypocrisy. It's a religious hypocrisy. You see, you say you're a hypocrite because you said, you said, you say, God said, but in reality, what you do is what man said. You are saying it's God, God's commandment, but you're doing man's tradition. Exalting man's traditions to the level of God's commandments is hypocrisy. People end up doing things that are the opposite of what they are professing, and they don't even know it half the time. Because they get deceived and blinded by their own traditions. And it's important to understand this because a huge percentage of what people recognize today as religion, whether it's any, pick, your, pick whatever religion you want, even Baptist, Christian, Catholic, Mormon, whatever, what people recognize as religion, a huge percent of it is really not much more than just tradition a lot of times. And remember, tradition doesn't necessarily start out bad. Whoever the Pharisee was that invented the washing of the hands before eating, you know, whoever that was, he, he probably wasn't sitting around one day thinking, Ugh, I just hate the scriptures. And uh, I wonder what I could do to make the commandment of God of none effect. Oh, I know. I'll come up with this idea of washing the hands before e eating. <laughs> You know, I don't think that's really how that started. <laughs> um, think about it. Some Pharisee, you know, maybe 100, 200 B.C., who knows, was probably uh, reading in, in the Old Testament, studying the things about the Levitical laws, about uh, being clean before you eat, and certain things you can eat and certain things you can't eat. The things you touch can make you unclean and various things like that. He's probably reading about that stuff. And he recognized, you know, hey, God likes clean things. Sure, Old Testament, yeah. And one day, you know, he, when he was eating his lamb gyro, you know, and his tzatziki sauce, spicy, you know, he was, uh, saw how dirty his hands were. And he thought, man, you know, I take, all, I take all this time and effort, you know, to eat the right things and not touch defiled things. And then I stick food in my mouth without even washing my filthy hands. I really ought to wash my hands before I eat. That's probably how it began. And so he starts washing before every meal. And since he's, you know, the leader in the synagogue, a teacher in the synagogue, you know, his students noticed this and asked him about it. And he told him, them his reasoning. Well, this is the reason why I always wash my hands before I eat. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. And some decided to do it simply because master so-and-so does it. And so this must be right, therefore. Others, you know, decided to do it because, you know, I think he's right. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think I'm going to start washing my hands before I eat, too. And, after, and it just became a thing, you know. And after a while, if you didn't do it, people began to look at you like, what's your problem? <laughs> and uh, we never did this before, but now this is what we're doing. And now you've, you're a weirdo if you don't. And, um, you know, people say, what, you don't see the need for this? You know, you think you're smarter than our teacher. And before everybody, for long, everybody did it. And then it got called a conviction. <laughs> and uh, when the teachers at the synagogue, you know, as time goes by, everybody starts doing this, it becomes a thing. And as time goes by, as the teachers at the synagogue, you know, they would be uh, uh, preaching hand washing before eating. You know, people in the congregation would say things like, that's good preaching. 
you know. And uh, maybe uh, teachers would say things like, you know, hey, if you don't have any con- if you don't have any convictions of your own, like washing your hands before dinner, why don't you borrow some of mine until you get some of your own? You know, and then they'd gut up ministerial students, you know, they'd further the tradition, not because it was supported by Scripture, but because, well, that's the way we've always done it. Mm. And within a generation, this tradition becomes equal with Scripture. Which means if you didn't do it, you're sinning against God. Hmm. And the Pharisees, they would get up and they would open the book and they would preach on hand washing again, like every Sunday practically it seems like. And they say, the reason we wash our hands before eating is because the Bible says so. <laughs> Hypocrite! <laughs> Hypocrite. The Word of God did not say that. You said God said that when He didn't say that. And then you do something saying God told you to when God never told you to. But you're saying that God said so. You are saying one thing, but doing something that is not the thing that you said you're doing. You are doing what man says, but saying that it's what, that it's what God says. That's hypocrisy. Traditions are not wrong in and of themselves sometimes. Some traditions may have some good points to them. Hey, personally, I think that washing your hands before eating is a pretty good idea. I mean, really, I'm not against it. But when I forget to wash my hands, and when I eat with unwashed hands, if I perceive it as a sin against God that I need to confess to God, uh uh-oh, Something's very wrong here. Somewhere in my mind or somewhere in my heart, I've taken this thing too far. I personally think that washing your hands before eating is a good idea. But when I see someone else eat with unwashed hands, and I start getting annoyed and upset and indignant with that brother that eats with unwashed hands, and I start to perceive that I'm more spiritual than that person uh, since they don't wash their hands before eating. Uh Uh-oh. Something's wrong. Somewhere in my mind or somewhere in my heart, I've taken a thing too far, you see. I've crossed into a territory of subtle hypocrisy. Because I'm saying that God said something, and I'm doing that thing, but I'm doing a thing that is really what man says, but I'm saying that God said it. I'm a hypocrite. If you were to tell me that I was a hypocrite, I would never believe you because I would insist that I am doing indeed the things that I profess. I profess you must wash your hands. God said you must wash your hands before eating anything, and that's what I do. So I'm not a hypocrite. But that kind of hypocrisy that you're thinking of, the typical hypocrisy, is not the problem. Subtle hypocrisy is the problem. Subtle hypocrisy is doing what man says when you say you're doing what God says. Adhering to traditions, but calling it obedience to God's commandments. You see, what you are doing is different from what you are saying. Do you see that? Your actions do not match your words. Hypocrite. You understand? There's many things that Christians preach that are really just traditions. It's fine to preach various things that you think are good and give your reasons, but you always have to remain true to the Scriptures and acknowledge if a thing is truly what God said or if you think it's just a good idea. Me personally, me and Mark talked about it this morning, I hate wearing a mask (laughs) into a business. It just drives me up the wall. And I push and I kick against the pricks and I do all kinds of stuff. I I just, I, I, I'm kind, I'm cordial to people for the most part. I don't, I I give people a little bit of pushback. Okay. But uh, I understand. I get the reasons and all that stuff, but I have my own reasons for why I like to buck that. But I'm not going to get up here and say that you have to do that too. And if you don't, You're not right with God because the Bible says, and then come up with a couple verses that try to prove that you shouldn't wear masks because if you do, you're going to just contribute to people taking the vaccine before long. 
I have my reasons, and I think they're pretty good reasons. <laughs> but if you don't want to go along with it, if you, don't have, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But when I get up here and I start saying, well, the Bible says that you, and you have to start doing my thing, and I'm making my tradition, my, con- I don't know if I call it a conviction, but my opinion, a commandment, I've become a hypocrite. You know, I've, there's a lot of church, I've been in church for over 20 years, and I love Bible-believing churches. I wouldn't trade them for anything. They're the best. But as you know, I don't, I'm not the only one that knows this. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are preached over the pulpit as the Bible says, when really, especially in a New Testament standpoint, New Testament concept, not under the law, but under grace, you're preaching a tradition, a Baptist tradition, maybe even a good tradition. But it's still a tradition. But it's turned into a commandment. Uh, well, baptism is an ordinance, and that is something that Paul taught. Um, it doesn't do anything for your soul, but uh, it is something that is just a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In America, it doesn't mean as much as it would as, say, into one of these Arabic countries. You get baptized, you are basically publicly, it's a public statement that's saying, I reject what I've been taught. And I'm going with Christ. And a lot of times I don't get you killed. So baptism is, a, is an ordinance, the same with the Lord's Supper. But I'm talking about things like women can't wear pants. Uh, men can't wear shorts. Um, you can't wear wire-rimmed glasses. You know, you, I'm talking about you have to, if you're a woman, you have to wear a special head thing on your head. I've heard a lot of things, especially down in the South. <laughs> They're very, very conservative, and they've got a lot of traditions. And they can have their traditions, that's fine. But when you start making tradition the commandments of God, and even try to start pulling things out of the Old Testament and trying to insert it and force it into the New Testament, say, thus saith the Lord, you have to do this. And I'm even going to say it, tithing, trying to make, get, you have to give 10%. Well, the gross of the net, who cares? You can't cram tithing into the New Testament church Amen. age. It's not there. You find it in the book of Hebrews, but it's referring to something in the Old Testament. Every sermon I've ever heard on tithing, they've got a lot of good reasons. There's a lot of good arguments. You could say, well, Jacob did it, and Abraham did it, and no, 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 so therefore, that's what we do. But I've heard guys say, if you can't even tithe 10%, you're not right with God. Something's wrong with your walk with God. You have no faith. To which I say, show it to me in the New Testament. That's a tradition. That's a Jewish tradition. And it's not advocated post-Calvary. Paul said, you're, I don't want to go off into this rabbit trail, but Paul said, you give... How, um, the specific wording is slipping me. He says, you give not grudgingly, nor of necessity. That's a tithe. For God loveth a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Give whatever you want. Ask the Lord. Now, if you want to give 10%, that's your conviction, that's fine. That's totally fine. If you want to give 15%, that's fine. It doesn't matter. If you want to give 5%, that's fine. Why not just take it to the Lord? You're under grace. You have liberty. God, this is, thank you for my job. Thank you for my paycheck. What would you have me to give? I'd like to give this to you. Isn't that it? I mean, I mean there's a lot of freedom there, a lot of liberty, and a lot of times Christians and even Bible believers get really nervous around these kind of things. But listen, I'm not going to get up here and teach a bunch of Baptist traditions that I can't prove from the Word of God. And that, I came across that when I came to that tithing subject. I said, well, I'm going to teach a lesson on tithing, start studying it. Oh, I can't find it in any of Paul's epistles. <laughs> I wonder why. Hmm, I've heard all the arguments. I've heard all the arguments. I've, like I told you, I grew up in church. I know the arguments. I could probably, I could preach a whole sermon on the arguments and convince you. <laughs> convince you that you're not right with God if you don't give 10%, not of your gross, but of your net. Oh boy, I could, I could peel your hide with a sermon on tithing. But I'm not going to do it. Because I don't find it in the New Testament post-Calvary. If you want to, fine. That's fine. And, you can, and maybe there's some good reasons, and yeah, there's, there's some things that are fine with it, whatever. But it's not a commandment. I feel like, I believe, if I taught it as a commandment, I'd be saying, God says, when in reality, God didn't say that. That's what man has said, now that we're in a New Testament context. And I'd be a hypocrite. So, you always have to keep the wall of separation between tradition and Scripture. 
Traditions are not necessarily bad, but what makes them bad is when those traditions become Scripture, and the perception becomes those who do it are right with God and spiritual, and those who don't do it are not right with God and not spiritual. Beware of that, because that is very, very dangerous. And all Jesus said, all therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, like the Scriptures, the actual Word of God, what the Bible says, that observe and do. The Scriptures. But do ye not after their works, traditions, for they say... Thus saith the Lord, and they do not. Why? Because what they're saying is, what they do is, thus saith our tradition. You see that? So anyway, hope that makes sense to you this morning. Hope that gives you something to think about. And let's have a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you for your word. I completely realize, Lord, that this uh, lesson flies in the face of uh, tradition. And God, uh, it's probably, you know, about, it would probably about be a sermon that would be about as popular as what Jesus preached to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Father, it's, it, or, well, not even that popular. That was, yours was way less popular. But God, uh, I, I, these things are important, Father. We have to be careful not to put ourselves back under the law because we're under grace. And Father, I, we don't need to be back in bondage, even if it's Baptist bondage, or if it's, uh, Lord, our particular group. Lord, I love the Baptists. I believe that they're the closest to the truth. They hold up the Word of God, and I wouldn't go to any other group. But, Father, there's even things in our group, because it's human nature, that try to get inserted as, in, as traditions to be made into Scripture. And, God, uh, by Your grace, I'm not going to do that. Father, I want to stay true to Your book. And, God, if it's in the book, then okay. And if it's not, then whatever. Father, um, I know a lot of times this kind of thing can contribute to self-righteousness, observing traditions and trying to make traditions into Scripture, and then thinking that you're better than someone else because you keep traditions uh, than someone else who doesn't keep your tradition. Father, help us, Lord, to be aware of these things. God, this was the thing that prevented the kingdom of heaven from coming. And Father, I pray that you'd help us, God, to not fall into the same trap, Lord, here in these last days of the church age, Lord, to be emphasizing and focusing on traditions as opposed to the Scriptures. Help us, Lord, just to focus on the Scriptures, the Word of God, and just have liberty with one another and have liberty with ourselves and just rejoice and rest in the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you and we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I got a question. Yes. So like when it comes to the days of... Oh, sorry. <laughs> 